Good morning, happy Friday. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who, uh, who came at the start of a long weekend. Um, today we're going to be talking about the glass sea state and the glass transition. And uh, what this will lead us into is a discussion of mechanical properties. And uh, we'll talk about uh, how the glassy state and the crystalline state and the TG uh, and, and where you are um, relative to TG and TM uh, influence the stress-strain uh, behavior of the materials and also the time-dependent stress-strain behavior, at least um, uh, at, the, um, at the sort of the surface level on uh, Wednesday. So we've been hinting at uh, TG for a long time. We've mentioned it uh, quite a few times, but we're going to uh, tell you a little bit about how the structure evolves as you reach um, uh, TG. And through all this discussion, we're talking about uh, amorphous samples or the uh, amorphous domains of semi-crystalline samples. Remember, it doesn't make sense for a crystalline region to have a, uh, a TG. Now, the glassy state is uh, kinetically trapped. That is to say that the crystalline state is actually more favorable because the crystalline state takes better advantage of the van der Waals interactions between chains. So at temperatures below the TG, we're said to be in a glassy state. And you can think of this as frozen spaghetti. Or if you're Giada de Laurentiis, frozen spaghetti. And this state uh, accommodates strain because these chains are locked in place. There's not enough thermal energy in the system to allow the chains to slide past each other. So how they accommodate strain is by local bending and unbending of bonds. That is small strains, strains prior to fracture. Uh, large uh, stresses are, are dissipated by a fracture of covalent bonds. So literally carbon-carbon atoms will cease to bond here. This sample is, uh, is fractured. But stresses that are smaller than the stress that it takes to fracture the sample can be dissipated to some extent by uh, local rotations of bonds. And these are called uh, sub-TG relaxation mechanisms. And this contributes to the toughness of a polymer sample. The toughness is the total energy density that is absorbed by a polymer sample or in a sample of any material prior to fracture. So the glassy, polymer, glassy polymers are still uh, tougher. That is, they absorb 
more energy, strain energy, prior to fracture than, say, ceramics. Not always, but in general. Uh, due to sub uh, TG relaxation mechanisms or energy uh, dissipation mechanisms, as in um, polyethylene, you can have motions. like this, where these bonds can rotate, or in a, uh, in a trans geometry, Oops. they can rotate uh, like this. And this is called a, a crankshaft mechanism. So these bond rotations take energy, but they don't deform the sample as a whole. And these mechanisms are not really available in, say, an inorganic glass where every atom is bonded to all the other atoms in the vicinity. So it's really a, a, a matter of the one-dimensionality of a polymer chain that allows this type of energy dissipation mechanism. Yep. What's the difference between that and the randomness confirmation we need to, to, let's say, just energy being there? Um, what is the difference between... Like, you know how can, like, can this happen in the absence of mechanical uh, force? Yes, it can happen in the absence of mechanical force, but it... Uh, but it also, but it's, you get more of these motions as you add energy mechanically into the system. Yep. Is this, uh, would an example of this be like the neutral states, say those states that are less energetically favorable being suddenly more energetically favorable than say the fracture under stress? Like, um, you bend into those states rather than fracture? Uh, you're not, in these, in this case, the concentration of the of the mechanical en energy at the covalent bonds is not sufficient to break them, but it is sufficient to trigger rotational movement of the bonds. So uh, yes, you are transiently giving more energy to the system to access uh, more energy, energetically disfavorable um, dihedral angles than you would, uh, than you would ordinarily. So how about the, uh, the glass transition? How can we think about this? So we're going to start by, uh, this, is, this is an analogy for uh, semi-crystalline samples. So you have amorphous domains, you have crystalline domains, and as you raise the temperature above Tg, it, it's not, you don't get a fluid, you still have a solid because the crystalline domains behave almost like cross-links that hold the material together. So suppose um, you make, suppose you have a metal rod and a, and a rubber hose. And the rubber is made of a semi-crystalline polymer, like thermoplastic polyurethane or something. And you take this and you dip it in liquid nitrogen, so it's frozen. And then you uh, remove the steel rod and now you have a frozen rubber hose. 
What, is the, what are the mechanical properties of a frozen rubber hose that has been wound up into this uh, helix? It's going to behave like a spring, right? So it'll, um, because it's thin enough, it will bend. It won't, the, the hose itself won't stretch, but the whole construct will stretch because it has this, because it can convert tensile strains into bending strains of the, uh, of the rubber hose. So this is, uh, this is at low T. So this is T less than TG. Um, and what we have is uh, it's stiff, metal-like, uh, low damping. So it stores all the energy, or it stores all the mechanical energy as opposed to dissipating the mechanical energy. Um, there's low time dependence because as, as soon as you as soon as you compress it, it provides a restoring force which immediately pushes back. What if you raise the temperature up to uh, up to Tg? So this is around uh, Tg. Now what happens is that the molecules in the rubber hose itself start to dissipate uh, mechanical energy by having the chains slide past each other, but the crystalline domains in the rubber hose are still holding the bulk structure together. So in the vicinity of, uh, of Tg, you have a warming transition. It is now a weaker spring. It uh, dissipates energy. In other words, uh, damping. And now you have some time dependence of the mechanical response. Now suppose you are now solidly above Tg, but still below Tm. Now you have a uh, now you have a completely warmed rubber hose that can no longer maintain its helical structure. Remember, this is a macroscopic object. This is not just a polymer chain. It's it's literally a drawing with chalk representing a rubber hose. And what we have now is that it's uh, completely warmed. And it's rubber-like. Now we have low damping again. And now uh, a low time dependence again. Because now all the springiness of the spring is, all of the behavior of the spring is now, is now being uh, controlled by the molecular mechanisms in the rubber itself. And this is now in the state where we, where, where we have just a rubber band. And if you've all seen my video on rubber bands and entropic elasticity, it's the same mechanism. Okay, what if you are just for fun above TM, you have a pool of goo. Assuming this is a thermoplastic elastomer like polyurethane, like thermoplastic polyurethane. Yes. So in, a, in an ideal solid, like a, uh, like a metal block, or, or even, a, even a rubber band, although a rubber band still has a little bit more 
time dependence. As soon as you apply a stress, as soon as you apply a strain, the stress, the restoring force responds immediately. There are situations like in viscoelastic solids, uh, and we'll talk more about this on Wednesday, but in viscoelastic solids, it takes time for the molecules to respond to, a, to, a, to a, an instantaneous strain. So you apply a step strain, and right away, the restoring force is, is strong. But over time, the restoring force of the sample becomes weaker as the molecules realign to their new reality. And that's the origin of time dependence. And you can see that in like uh, chewing gum, for example. Uh, if you poke it, it rebounds right away. But if you stick your finger in there and jab it in there for like a minute, then it automatically, then it, then it indents. So that would be an example um, of a time-dependent uh, mechanical behavior. Yeah. Really technical question. Is chewing gum a polymer? Yes. Chewing gum is a polymer. Anyone ever, um, someone asked this in office hours the other day, anyone ever chew gum for a really long time and it starts to decompose? Um, it's because of the, uh, because you have, um, you've worked the gum enough to give you, uh, to, to break the chemical bonds in the gum just by mechanical energy over and over again. And, uh, and you've, you've actually done, um, uh, done mechanochemistry with your mouth. Uh, it, it takes a long time. Right, Be, but but eventually, like statistically, over time, um, certain chemical bonds are going to absorb enough concentration of mechanical energy to, to break them. So it actually accumulates. Um, uh, uh, it actually accumulates a bond uh, bond cleavage events. Okay, now at TG. TG is when you, TG is when you um, allow, you have enough thermal energy in the system uh, for polymer chains to slide past each other. I don't know if the definition is quite, uh, quite clear. Say about 50 chains to slide past each other, or 50 monomers in the chain to slide past each other. Activation energy for that process occurs at around TG. TG is a little bit of a, of a, of a sloppy concept um, because it's not, a, it's not a true first order phase transition like a melting temperature. Um, but at TG, but 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 um, but it's really important. It's really important technologically, and also you get a lot of other um, effects. So at at TG, you have not only a change in the mechanical properties, and usually orders of magnitude difference in mechanical properties below TG, where it's a glass, and above TG, where it's uh, either a rubber or a viscoelastic liquid, depending on if it's totally amorphous or semi-crystalline, you have a change in specific volume. This is just the inverse of the density, cubic centimeters per gram. And what happens, does it, what is the change? It goes up, specific volume goes up. How about the modulus? Modulus is just the, like the spring constant of a solid in, from Hooke's law. What happens to the modulus? The modulus goes down. How about the heat capacity? We already um, mentioned this in our discussion of, uh, of DSC. But the heat capacity uh, of the rubbery regime is 
greater than the heat capacity of the glassy state. And also the dielectric constant changes. Dielectric constant and the refractive index. So that uh, refers to its ability to be polarized in an electric field. And the dielectric constant and refractive index where um, dielectric constant, square root of the dielectric constant is proportional to the refractive index. And this, is, this, uh, this goes down, and that's largely due to the change in density. Why would the density matter? Well, if you have more stuff per unit volume, then you have more stuff that can be polarized and which can store the energy of an electric field. Yeah? So this is uh, TG going towards crystallization of the temperature, like not becoming more of a TG? Or going from glassy yeah, to, glassy to, to the TG. Going from glassy to at the TG and a little above the TG. This is what happens as we pass through the TG from low T to high T. This is what happens. So TG is a second order phase transition. So unlike the melting transition, there's no discontinuity in entropy, enthalpy, or volume. So suppose you have, suppose you're looking at the melting temperature and you have a crystalline solid over here, and you have a liquid up here, we see discontinuities in several of the thermodynamic functions, like VHS, video home system displaced by DVD, digital video disc, and then digital versatile disc, and now just DVD, and now just obsolete. At TG, in contrast, if we have a glass to a liquid, and TG is around here, we don't get a discontinuity. There's no latent heat. So there's a latent heat of first order phase transitions. And the latent heat is the amount of heat that it takes at a material's transition temperature, like melting temperature or um, boiling temperature, to uh, convert all of that stuff from one phase to another. So once you've reached the boiling point, it takes um, some additional amount of heat to break all the bonds in the, in the condensed phase and, and, um, uh, and vaporize it into the vapor phase, and that's called the latent heat. There's no similar concept for, uh, for the TG, for the glass transition. Now, in terms of chemical structures,
what are some of the structural characteristics that give you uh, that give you a lower or higher TG? One of them is the flexibility of the uh, of the of the polymer backbone. So polymer uh, repeat unit and TG. Let's look at PDMS, which is silicone, rubber. So that's cross-linked silicone. And the repeat unit is polydimethylsiloxane, PDMS, and it's TG, and this is in units of Kelvin, is 150, so way below room temp. That's why uh, silicone before you cross-link it is uh, liquid silicone, after you cross-link it is silicone rubber. Polyethylene is this, TG is 180. But I thought milk jugs were solid at room temperature, which is 273K. Um, why is it still solid? Because it's semi-crystalline. It still has crystalline uh, domains that keep it, uh, keep it whole. PEO or PEG, so polyethylene oxide or polyethylene glycol, same thing, although polymer scientists prefer PEO because it's more, because it refers to the, to the polymerization of the monomer, ethylene oxide, 206. The difference between um, uh, so, so what we have is, uh, is freer rotation as we go up this chain. If we look at some aromatic polymers, Polyphenylene oxide. Which has the structure of benzene rings linked by oxygen atoms. We have a TG of 356. And another polymer that many of you will encounter um, if you go on in microfabrication or Packaging is polyparaxylene, this is called uh, paraline, and paraline has the structure of benzene rings linked by ethylene, by an ethylene unit. And this has a very high TG, which is what makes it a good material for electronics packaging of 553 Kelvin. So paraline is used um, in the semiconductor manufacturing um, industry to, to give you, to provide heat resistant coatings to um, electronic uh, 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 devices so that when they heat up, Air doesn't get in, but the polymer also doesn't, uh, doesn't degrade because the TG is so high. There are also steric effects. Of pendant groups. So if you look at polypropylene, So 
So essentially all synthetic carpets, probably the stuff that the seat back cushions are made out of, at least the, um, uh, the fabric is uh, polypropylene, which is this. And it's uh, 253. Polypropylene is abbreviated uh, PP in the recycling symbols. Um, polymethyl methacrylate. Or PMMA. Or plexiglass. Has a bulkier group uh, as a side chain, and its TG is 279. Polystyrene, this is something that we talked about pretty early on in the class, which is just polypropylene, but this CH3 group is instead of benzene ring, and it has a TG of 373, or about 100K. Um, and if you increase the size of this bulky thing even more, So polyvinyl naphthalene which I, I don't know what this is used for but it's fused benzene rings so this is the naphthal unit. Naphthalene is famous as uh, mothballs Probably don't want to use mothballs because naphthalene causes cancer. And it's 408. So this is increased bulk. And hindered rotation. And one more effect. This is a configurational so configurational isomerism. And I'm just going to draw one example. So polybutadiene from which you can make car tires and a bunch of other stuff. Polybutadiene, this is the uh, cis form. Has a TG of 165, but the trans form more than meets the eye. I was about to write transformer. <laughs> is 255. And the reason for this is because the transform has more efficient packing. So more efficient packing in the glassy state reduces the free volume and it, reduce, and it increases the intermolecular forces. So it takes more activation energy to allow these polymers to slide past each other, which is what happens at the TG. Now the TG is responsible for an increase in the volume of a of a polymer sample as you approach the TG but it's also affected by the amount of as in the cis and trans example the amount of free volume that you have in the system to begin with. So a system with, a, with more free volume in it is going to have a, uh, a lower TG. So I'm going to draw a simplified uh, picture. And this is for the amorphous domains only. And this will be really simplified. 
So this is the temperature in units of Kelvin. Okay, so what is the, uh, what is the volume made of? So we're going to plot the, uh, the molar volume. Um, and first, the first thing the volume is made of is the electron clouds of the atoms, right? And the bonds. And we call that the van der Waals volume, V naught. And the van der Waals volume reflects the fact that at equilibrium, atoms only want to be so close to each other by van der Waals attraction. You push them too far, too, too close together, and the Pauli exclusion principle takes over, and the electron repulsion pushes them apart, take them too far apart, and the London dispersion forces bring them back together. So the equilibrium distance is the van der Waals, uh, the van der Waals um, uh, radius or, 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 uh, or bond length between two atoms. So that's V naught. Now you can't, now if an atom is roughly spherical, you can't pack an infinite, you can't pack them infinitely closely like a gumball machine. A gumball machine you can still fill with water, right? I don't know if anyone has ever bought a, purchased a gumball from a gumball machine besides me and, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, the, the, the gumball machine effect is the fact that we can't pack these things infinitely closely. So we have maybe about 45% bigger, depending on the polymer, 1.45 V naught is this band. And this is the packing volume, or the free volume. Now the packing volume of the free volume is not just a consequence of the sizes of the gumballs, it's also the sizes of the, it's also the shapes of the molecules, right? So if you, you so because these things are really beads on a string, even if they wanted to pack as closely as gumballs, they wouldn't necessarily be able to because they're constrained to be exactly next to each other in conformations, some of which are more favorable than others. So it's going to be a little bit more free volume than there would be in just like a, just a, a pure gumball machine. And let's just say, for the sake of argument, it's about 45% larger than the, uh, than the van der Waals volume. Then if you're starting at uh, absolute zero and you start increasing the temperature, then the molecular motions, so the, the, um, the kinetic energy as, as a manifestation of temperature is increasing the, uh, the, uh, the vibrations and the, uh, and the amount of, of motion in the material, which increases the average volume. If they're all shaking, then the thing gets bigger, and this is just thermal expansion. And the thermal expansion changes at Tg. And this is the expansion volume. And depending on the polymer, the expansion volume occurs at, a, at about 60% greater, very roughly. These are very rough, but not ridiculously off, uh, of the van der Waals volume. So the Tg. At the TG, the total volume of the system is about 60% greater than the, uh, than, the, than the free volume, or sorry, than the, than the van der Waals volume. The packing volume or free volume itself controls where the TG is. If the packing volume is a little bit bigger, um, then the TG occurs at a lower temperature because it takes less energy to overcome the, uh, the intermolecular forces between the molecules. So the free volume uh, determines to a large extent let's say partially the 
the TG as the free volume goes up the TG goes down now how do we control the free volume the free volume can be increased by polydispersity So the chain ends, polymers can't, uh, can't pack efficiently around chain ends. Low molecular weight, again, because of chain ends. The low molecular weight stuff has a higher density of chain ends and therefore less efficient packing. Uh, plasticizers. You know, uh, new car smell? New car smell is uh, volatile organic compounds known as plasticizers that are leaching into the air from the soft touch plastics in the new car. And um, they're very good for us and safe, so don't worry. Uh, but that's what it is. And, with that, and over time, like if you have a really old car, um, if you ever notice that the soft touch plastic is now kind of brittle and has it started to fracture on some of our cars? Uh, so the plasticizers are, are small molecules that fit their way into the, the, um, the polymer structure and permit the chains to slide past each other by, by, um, by kind of, uh, uh, it's almost like providing more chain ends, higher density of chain ends, less efficient packing, more free volume, volatile car smell, it all makes sense. Branching. Again, anything that leads to less efficient packing, sometimes, particularly in the laboratory, We are processing a film or a bulk sample and we have residual solvent. Residual solvent has the same effect as a plasticizer that's added deliberately. And all forms of inefficient packing like cis. trans isomerism. Okay, I want to give you a primer on stress and strain as we've been talking about these mechanical uh, properties. And this will be the last topic that we cover in the course before week 10. But it's very closely related to, uh, to, to TG. So imagine a solid block of, semi of a semi-crystalline polymer. that has area, cross-sectional area A, and initial length um, L naught. And we stretch it. Now what happens is that the cross-sectional area shrinks a little bit and the length increases by some amount and let's say that this is L naught and this distance is delta L then we can define 
Now this is for small, so for small strains, less than about, less than or approximately equal to about 10%. So the strain is defined as delta L over L naught times 100%. It could be as a fraction or as a percent. Make sure you know what you're looking at. And the stress is the force per unit area that it took to accomplish this deformation. In the uh, in the direction, well, perpendicular to the uh, to area. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? Stretching it this way, it's the force vector is perpendicular to the to the cross section. And there's another uh, quantity called the Poisson ratio. which has the symbol nu which is the contraction of the cross-sectional dimension let's draw a coordinate system just so that um, we know what we're talking about here let's say this is y x and z. So it's a contraction of the cross-sectional dimension x or y with lengthening of z. And this is the fractional contraction. You could also say that this is the negative ratio of transverse to axial strain, but we're not going to say it like that um, because although technically that's, uh, that encompasses everything, it's not that intuitive to say it like that. So let's say that uh, if so if x and y shrink from 1 to 0 0.95 at 10% strain in Z, then the Poisson ratio is 0 0.95 five for rubber. And we can imagine there's a field uh, called mechanical metamaterials that have bizarre, uh, so we're, we're used to things shrinking in the transverse dimension as we apply an axial strain. As, a, as we apply a longitudinal strain, things shrink in the axial dimension and vice versa. We press on things in the longitudinal direction and the transverse dimensions increase. There's a field called mechanical metamaterials where you, you, you devise struts and things to allow things to actually expand in the transverse dimension, which is called a negative Poisson ratio. Um, and in fact, there are natural, uh, naturally occurring materials that have bizarre Poisson ratios, like cork, for example undergoes essentially no contraction in the transverse dimension with an axial load and that's called a um, that's called a zero that would be a zero Poisson ratio so we will end here and we'll start on Wednesday with a discussion of stress strain curves and um, viscoelasticity so thank you very much for your attention and have a good long weekend <laughs>